you mentioned the definition of morality is kind of problematic in the moral landscape in the book. So can you tell me about this? Um, yes. Um, I think what the book does, it conflates two things. On the one hand, um, really uh, one major intention of Harris is, is to point out that there are moral truths mm. uh, and that there is something like a universal morality that is absolutely true. On the other hand, uh, he also points out, this is equally a major thing for him, uh, he wants to point out that there are objective, or rather I should say scientific, or he should say scientific to be more precise, truth about human well-being, right? Mm -hmm. there, uh, and for him the two things are the same, mm -hmm. right? On the one hand, uh, objective moral truth, universal morality, on the other hand, uh, scientific facts about uh, what increases well-being and what doesn't. Now I think the two things, he, for him the two things are the same. Mm. And I think the two things are very different yes. from one another. Uh, and I think that's the major problem of the book, that he conflates or tries to combine these two things. Now, um, what is different between uh, the two? Mm. Um, I think in order to understand this we can go back to uh, a philosophical, short philosophical essay written uh, or actually written later on. It was actually a little uh, presentation yes. by Ludwig Wittgenstein, the famous philosopher. Um, uh, it's nearly 100 years old and then it was published much later. Anyways, Wittgenstein, it's Wittgenstein's lecture on ethics. And um, in this lecture on ethics, um, Wittgenstein says very clearly, uh, there are two different ways in which we use the terms good or right. Uh, either we use them in a relative sense or in a trivial sense. Uh, for instance, this is the right way to go to London or uh, whatever, Th this to uh, give you other examples, um, whatever, this is a good meal or um, this is a good swimmer or this is a good tennis player, this is an example that he uses. And that is uh, always in a relative and a trivial sense. These, these are all examples for the usage of good or right in a relative or trivial sense because it's good or right relative to a certain perspective, to a certain activity, uh, and so forth. It's, 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 it's a concretely specified use of uh, good. Um, for instance, the right way to a place might be one that is faster than another way, or it might be one that is um, whatever, safer than another way, or it might be um, a more scenic than another way, right? Um, so uh, this is what, 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 what he means with relative, that it is relative to a specific criterion. Now, and that is different from uh, the um, usage of good or right, in what um, Wittgenstein calls in an absolute sense. That something is absolutely good, right? Um, for instance, he gives this example um, about the tennis player. Yes. Uh, someone can say, uh, oh, uh, you're uh, not a good tennis player. And then you can say, yeah, I don't care, I just play for fun. I don't really want to become a really good tennis player. But that's very different if someone, uh, what's very different is if someone uses the term good in an absolute way and says, you're not a good person. Yeah. Right? Uh, then this is something where you can't really say, oh, I, I don't really want to be a good person, right? Uh, that's, uh, that is, uh, the usage of the word is on an entirely different uh, level. Uh, it's on this absolute level. And um, uh, so uh, not relative to anything specific. And Wittgenstein then says, um, in this we use this term, uh, we speak of good uh, or right in an absolute way, and actually that makes, doesn't really make sense uh, because it's not tied to any kind of specific criterion. For, uh, and, and therefore we, we, it's, it's something that has a great appeal to us, um, but it's something that is beyond description and language and actually also beyond uh, understanding to a certain uh, extent. Uh, 
Um, so he thinks that's a problematic use of language and he comes to the at least implicit conclusion that while uh, thinking in such absolute terms uh, maybe something that is, let's say, uh, for humans even indispensable. It is not something uh, that uh, um, uh, has any form of specific sense. Uh, and that illustrates again the distinction, I think, uh, that or the, the mistake that um, um, Harris makes because he tries to bridge uh, these two uh, usages of the word good or right and he thinks uh, if we uh, really find out what is good in any specific sense namely that it contributes to well-being then we can somehow make this step and speak uh, and, and find out what is morally good but I think that is the basic mistake that that he makes that he conflates these two usages and think we can optimize the relative usage so that it becomes absolute Right, And that's simply not possible. These are very different usages of the word and they do something very different. Uh, and I would say um, the relative use of the words good and right is an amoral use of the words good and right. And that's possible. And so I fully agree with Harris uh, that it totally makes sense to scientifically find out what contributes to well-being. The point, however, is well-being always in a relative sense. Well, the well-being in this way, for that person, in this context, with regard to this criterion. But we can never, as Harris falsely assumes, you know, summarize everything and then jump from well-being in this, this specific way for this specific person in this specific contents to well-being as such, right? And he always implies that this is possible and it's simply not, that it's simply not possible. Uh, another uh, thing that, I, uh, that is very interesting about Wittgenstein's paper, for me personally, that's maybe even more interesting, um, is that he also says, the, uh, the, if, we, uh, if we use the term relative, uh, if we use the terms good or right in a specific sense, it's not only relative, it's also trivial. Trivial in which way? Then he, he gives another example which I find very impressive. He says, if we could write a book in which the words good and right would be used in an absolute sense, then all other books would explode. What does he mean by this? Well, if we would be capable of saying in language, uh, this and that or that is absolutely good and right, then all other books which speak about what is good and right would be, uh, you know, would be insignificant compared to this other book. We wouldn't need to read them, right? And if you think about this, uh, which I think is true, uh, therefore, it's not even desirable to try to speak or to imagine that there would be such a book. Because then everything that we did so far, everything that we do in every moment of our life would be trivial, would be insignificant, right? So I wouldn't even, uh, that's, uh, uh, Wittgenstein thereby at least hints at a major problem of morality, namely that it speaks in a register which at least implicitly denies the significance to everything other than uh, this kind of uh, you know, language. Uh, if you really claim that you, are, that you are identifying moral truth in an absolute way, then implicitly you say, what everyone else is doing is insignificant and trivial to my endeavor. So it devalues implicitly uh, all other human activities. And I think that is already a very major problem uh, the, of um, morality and also of religious discourse in general. I think uh, Wittgenstein identified that um, um, quite well. So. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, so the problem with uh, Harris is not only that he conflates the two senses, 
but also, of course, that um, at least fr from my perspective, following up uh, on, on Wittgenstein, that moral truth or a universal morality does not exist. It is impossible to, uh, you know, speak of it in language. And in addition, again, it is not even desirable to speak in that kind of mode or to think in that kind of mode or to act in that kind of mode because it implicitly devaluates basically uh, everything, el uh, everything else uh, and therefore it's even an, a kind of a dangerous, uh, arrogant uh, attitude that isn't very helpful and that does not improve human well-being. So uh, what morality is, in fact, uh, is neither uh, the scientific attempt to identify that which is uh, good or right, because that is always relative or trivial. So that's not really morality. So Harris is, I think, wrong in claiming that the scientific attempt to increase well-being is uh, a moral uh, endeavor. Uh, and I think he's wrong in saying that moral truth or universal morality exists or that it is desirable to speak or think or act uh, in as if it uh, would exist. Um, what is morality actually? Well, morality is in actuality in our life precisely to speak in terms of moral truth or of a universal uh, universally valid uh, moral laws or something like this. So morality is a form of communication, right? The uh, morality is not the quality of a proposition or the quality of a principle because it's an illusory quality. It doesn't exist just like, as I believe, God doesn't yeah. exist, yeah. right? So moral truth does not exist in the similar way as God doesn't exist. Right? So, but that God doesn't exist doesn't mean that we don't have religion, right? Of course, religion exists. It's a specific way of thinking, acting, and it's a whole social system that, that comes from it. And in a similar way, morality in the sense that Harris thinks it exists, namely in the form of actually existing true moral propositions, instead of being this, actually existing morality is a specific discourse. So the, 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 that's what, rea just as religion is not something that depends on the existence of God, but is a specific social practice, specific form of communication that, uh, you know, relates to a certain unrealistic assumption. Likewise, morality is a specific discourse, a specific way of acting that is, relates to and derives from uh, making unrealistic uh, assumptions about something that doesn't exist. So that is also partly why you don't think morality is very good to trace for, to find, as you are immoral. Just as religion is very problematic, and Harris is one of the person who, people who pointed this out best in you know, contemporary society, is one of the main critics of religion. But I think in a similar way, he should be critical of moral discourse for the very same reasons. Mm. So mm. When, uh, whenever we look at what morality actually is as a specific form of discourse, a specific form of communication, then we can see it is very closely tied to conflict, to division, often to violence, right? It is a form of communication that makes makes people think in terms of good and evil. And once they start think and act in, ter in terms of good and evil, that for instance, um, sometimes can be used to make them do things that otherwise they wouldn't do. For instance, kill other people. Yes. Uh, so this kind of discourse, this kind of communication, this kind of thinking is not always, but potentially very dangerous. And it is very often typically just like religious discourse, which is what Harris describes, but in the same way, also moral, moral discourse, moral communication is used 
in order to make people, for instance, uh, do certain violent acts or hate other people or condemn other people, uh, which otherwise would be very difficult to convince them to do. Uh, so, uh, and this is also what the German sociologist uh, Niklas Luhmann uh, says, um, moral language is very dangerous. Uh, it is something that uh, is, has the potential uh, to uh, create social conflict, uh, to um, uh, you know, entice violence, and so forth and so forth. So it is something that uh, it's, a, it's a form of communication and thinking that, that is, empirically speaking, uh, highly problematic. I want to give you one example, which is actually the example that Harris begins the book with. Yes. The first example he gives, he gives many good examples. And uh, my conclusion of the example would be the absolute uh, opposite, or would be the total opposite of what, what his conclusion uh, is. The example is he speaks about um, violence in schools, violence in education, that still today in America, uh, uh, it, it is, uh, I found this surprising, but it's what he says, that it's still common, or at least was until recently, that students are being beaten. Uh, and he apparently thinks that, um, you know, if we would f make a study on well-being, we would find out that, um, you know, it's, it doesn't improve well-being if you beat students as a teacher, so we shouldn't do it. And for him, that's a moral, uh, you know, then that's a moral truth that would help us not beat students. But he totally uh, ignores the actual reasons uh, why people beat students in school. Well, they beat students in school and they have been beating beaten, uh, uh, you know, children in education for hundreds and thousands of years precisely because they think someone who doesn't study well is morally bad. And this gives you the right, or not even the right, even the duty yeah. to beat them in order to transform them from bad people into good people in a moral sense, yeah. rather than uh, focusing on them, on transforming them from a bad student to a good student in an amoral sense. Mm -hmm. So it's precisely because of morality that students are beaten and have been beaten throughout human history in education and that beating was considered a great means of education. Why? Because of morality because bad students were considered not relatively as bad in learning, but as bad people, and thereby they need to be beaten, and we need a kind of a moral punishment rather than an edu uh, uh, of, you know, um, uh, educational means. So it's precisely because in modern education, at least partly, education switched from a moral to an amoral mode that it increases well-being. So the increase of, of well-being is contrary to what Harris said, not an improvement of, mor of morality, but it's a moral deflation. We deflate morality, we demoralize education, and thereby we improve well-being. Right? So uh, it's, uh, it's flabbergasting that, that Harris doesn't see this, right? because it seems to me so obvious that the example proves the exact opposite of what he is trying to show.